Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a very cloudy, overcast, dismal day here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, even up here in the clouds on the ninth floor of Curtin Hall up here in the Center for 21st Century Studies. Uh, my name is Chris. I am uh, again sitting in for Josh Rivers and Nathan Humpel who usually do Cat's Mustache. Um, I believe everyone's oot in a boot, and I am doing my best to fill their mighty, mighty shoes. Um, last couple weeks I was playing uh, Dropsy uh, and thought, um, thought I might try something a little different today. <clears throat> Uh, I was thinking along the lines of King's Quest, uh, but uh, I decided to try something different. Yeah, something I'm a little, little more unfamiliar. And so in preparation for a project, uh, at least one project, using the Inform 7 Interactive Fiction Composer, uh, I'm going to start looking at some works of interactive fiction and uh, apologies to Josh and Nathan but I'm going to use this time to uh, check a few things out um, and so today I'm doing uh, interactive fiction is not completely foreign to me but it's been a long time um, uh, Scott Bruner and I have uh, talked about this uh, for some time, you know, just uh, in Classic Quest, we've talked a lot about Zork and Colossal Cave Adventure, and and that's about where I left interactive fiction. So this is kind of a return to uh, a familiar yet strange terrain. Um, I'm pretty excited, uh, especially because uh, as um, start getting that creative itch and would like to uh, you know, start work, doing a little bit of work in Inform 7. Have some experience with Twine, um, but uh, I'd like to try something a little different at this point. So today we're playing uh, Photopia, and that is a, a work uh, done in Inform by Adam Cadre, I think I'm pronouncing this right, uh, released in October of 1998. So we're looking at, what's that, 20 years now. Uh, that's pretty remarkable for a, you know, especially in a time where um, archiving and preservation of software has, it, you know, isn't a big enough issue in my opinion. It's great that authors and creators are uh, maintaining these works for us. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, this is your opening screen for Photopia. And so I'm just going to go ahead and play this. Um, though uh, whether play is the appropriate term to, to describe this, we'll see. Um, all right. All right, so, do you like instructions? As with most, um, I, I think I'm gonna go ahead and read this stuff out loud uh, just for the sake of accessibility and although it might, it certainly is gonna feel a little bit awkward, um, I think it's, something I, I have to be better about. So I'm gonna read, start reading this out loud. Okay, so I finished reading the opening paragraphs. What am I supposed to do with this thingy? Uh, good question. The, I'm not sure what it is, a side carrot? Anyway, the prompt appears when it is your turn to tell the game what you want to do. Simply type in, in an imperative statement like open the door or eat the sandwich and press the enter key. Also, articles aren't necessary. Open door or eat sandwich will work just as well. 
Occasionally, the game will ask you to clarify a command you've typed. For instance, if you eat, type eat sandwich, and there is more than one sandwich in your immediate vicinity, the game may respond, which sandwich do you mean, the ham sandwich or the bologna sandwich? It is not usually necessary to retype your command. Simply answering the question is fine. Ham is a sufficient reply, for example. <clears throat> of course, you don't have to answer the question if you don't want to. If you're a vegetarian and want to eat either sandwich, you can type open door and the game will treat it as an all new command. No matter how enthralling your initial location is, chances are you'll eventually want to go somewhere else. To do so, simply type the direction you want to go. Walk north is a perfectly acceptable direction command, but N will do the same thing and it is much easier to type. If you're not carrying a compass, you can still navigate with commands such as enter kitchen or exit. Uh, so this is a lot like MUDs and moves, something I'm a little bit more familiar with. Um, so sometimes you will encounter people and other animate creatures with whom you'll wish to converse. In Photopia, the verbs ask and tell have been replaced with the command talk to, for example, talk to the pirate, even such commands as yes and no are subsumed under the aegis of talk to. Talk to is your friend. Like most interactive fiction these days. <laughs> Photopia has a reasonably impressive vocabulary. Some words you might want to try are buy, close, drink, drop, eat, examine, give, jump, kill, kiss, knock, lick, listen, look, open, pull, push, put, read, Remove, search, show, sit, sleep, smell, taste, throw, tie, touch, turn, untie, wear. You can also combine many of these verbs with prepositions. In addition to look, you can look at, look inside, look under, look through, and so forth. There are also a number of special commands and abbreviations you should be aware of. In addition to the compass directions mentioned above, they include G, a short for again. This repeats the last command. These are the types of things where I need a notebook. Taking a page from the Scott Bruner Guide to Life, I am taking notes. G, short for again. I, inventory. L, short for look, and X for examine. <clears throat> so, G is short for again. This repeats the last command. I is short for inventory. This produces a list of what you are carrying. L, look, short for look, describes your surroundings. Uh, where'd I go? There we go. Um, and X, short for examine, this provides a description of the object. Z is short for wait. This causes a turn to pass without an action being performed. Quit ends the game. Restart. Restore. Save. Not available online. Um, I am playing this using the GLU Glue Looks interpreter. I have no idea how to pronounce that, but uh, so again, this is Photopia um, by Adam Cadre, a 20 year old work of interactive fiction recommended to me by uh, Scott Bruner um, as we look forward to working on a project in Inform 7. The rule of thumb here is to keep your commands as simple as possible. As long as you, uh, sorry, the main rule of thumb here is to keep your commands as simple as you can while still getting the meaning across. The parser has come a long way. Typos. When two words were the maximum allowed, you can enter commands such as give the banana to the rhesus monkey, then take all from the cage except the banana peel it will be understood perfectly but the parser will not understand things like walk up to the sign or go back to where I was a few minutes ago. Once you get the hang of it, the correct way to answer commands becomes second nature. So feel your way around, try things as they occur to you, and most of all, have fun. 
in this, um, one of the reasons I'm this compelled to do this today is that um, I'm kind of curious to see how familiar this feels. Again, I haven't played um, any work of interactive fiction with intent or purpose, uh, I want to say, ooh, in 30 years. Um, although I've done twine work, uh, this is a little bit different with the the parser um, rather than a, a using hyperlinks. So anyway, will you read me a story? Read you a story? What fun would that be? I've got a better idea. Let's tell a story together. All right, get my reading voice on. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. I have no idea what that would be. Speeding down Montgomery Boulevard, the streetlights are bright, unbearably bright. You have to squint as hard as you can to keep your retinas from bursting into flame. Welcome back to the land of the living, bud, Rob says. You plan to stick around for a while or are you going to pass out again? Because one thing I've learned about chicks is that they actually don't like it when you pass out on them in the middle of getting it on. You hear me? So if that's like your plan, then I'm dropping you off and showing up solo. You don't exactly remember where the day went, but as you listen to Rob rant on, bits of it start to float back to you. A day on the slopes, the brisk February wind against your face, polishing off a keg back at the lodge. Those two girls you and Rob had hit it off with, the ones who'd given you their address in town. We all should get together sometime, they'd said. Of course, Rob insisted that by sometime they'd meant later tonight. You hadn't been so sure, but then you blacked out before you could argue the point. How Rob came to be driving your car, you're not exactly sure. Apparently he couldn't wait till you were sober enough to drive it yourself. From the way he's weaving all over the road, he also apparently couldn't wait until he was sober enough to drive it either. Rob checks himself out in the rearview mirror. Man, I am one handsome dude, he says approvingly. Eh, all right. Please enter a command. Um... All right. Please select one. Ask Rob about blood alcohol level. Let's do... Uh, uh, for anyone watching, feel free to jump in. Um, if you're just joining, uh, my name's Chris. I'm sitting in for Nathan and Josh, who are usually playing... Uh, for Cat's Mustache. I am sitting in playing some interactive fiction today because I have no uh, puzzle games to play. Um, so we're playing Photopia by Adam Cadre. Feel free, when we get to choices, feel free to chime in. All right, you idiot, pull over. <clears throat> oh, let's try nothing. You decide not to say anything after all. Rob looks at a scrap of paper with the address on it as the two of you go screaming through an empty intersection. Oh man, it's a fake address. They gave us a... F no, wait, it's upside down. He turns the paper right side up. Oh hey, they're right on Bartlett Hill Road. Sweet. <clears throat> I'll try that again. Try saying nothing again. You not decide not to say anything after all. You look up. Hey, it's red, you say. Huh, what? Rob says, the light. You know, red as in stop. But you don't stop. You don't even slow down as you fly into the intersection and the light stays in unmistakable red. So we have a little bit of a little bit of graphics here. Red. Hmm. You are Wendy McKay, first girl on the Red Planet. When you signed up for this mission, you thought that you were going to be coming to a habitable colony. I should point out, um, 
because I am reading this out loud for accessibility. Um, this the the font on the um, interface has turned red. Uh, and there's a little bit of a red glow to the uh, window. See, the orbiter was supposed to drop all the pieces of the colony, the power plant, the living quarters, the greenhouse, things like that, onto the planet's surface, packed in airbags which would bounce around and then open up once they were safely on the ground. Some of the airbags were supposed to hold big trucks which could be operated by remote control. Dragging the pieces of the colony into their proper places. Your job was to was going to take a tour of the place and verify that everything was up and running. Verify means to make sure. Good to know. Instead, something went wrong on the orbiter, and it blew up before it had a chance to drop off its payload. Pieces of the orbiter and the colony rained all over the landscape. So this has become a salvage mission. Your instruments indicate that there's at least one piece that's still functioning. Functioning means it's not broken. Your job is to find that piece, or pieces, if there's more than one. So you climb down the ladder of your ship and step onto the surface of an alien world. Landing site. You are standing at the base of your ship. The onboard computers selected this general area as the most likely place to find salvageable remains of what would have been the colony. Salvageable means you can save it. The battered, rust-red landscape stretches out before you in every direction, pitted and pockmarked and littered with boulders. A ladder leads up to the hatch of your ship. Hey, kiddo, don't fall asleep on me yet. Talk to yourself. Uh, talking to yourself is a sign of impending mental collapse, kiddo. Talk to myself. Okay, just wanted to confirm that. Look at ship. This is your trusty spaceship, which you recently renamed from the space pony to the aspiration. A wise choice, if I may say so. Nothing like that seems to be around. Okay. You are standing next to what seems to be a piece of a bulldozer or some other sort of construction equipment. It is a set of wheels, each one bigger across than you are tall, wrapped in a tread like on an army tank. You can tell it landed with some force from the ring of debris that surrounds it in a perfect circle. So I went north again, uh, among the ruins of the living quarters. <clears throat> As you walk, you find first one geodesic panel, then another. When people make a dome out of simple polygons like triangles or hexagons, that's called geodesic. And this is, uh, I'm wondering, that bit there was in parentheses, and so I'm kind of interested in seeing, I'm curious what, if that's a, another voice. Um, or if that's the author. I doubt it's the author, but anywho. Soon the clear plastic panels are as plentiful as the rust red boulders. This must be where the dome for the living quarters landed. Soon you find your right. Scattered around you are the remains of what would have been home to the first wave of colonists. Most of the housing units have been reduced to unidentifiable splintered heaps, but there's one that seems to be intact. Intact means that it hasn't so damaged that it's unusable. The entrance is partially obstructed. Obstructed means blocked by debris, but you're small enough that you could probably squeeze through. 
That's part of what makes you the perfect person for this job. Aside from your astronautical experience, expertise, astronautical doesn't really mean anything. I just made it up. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wonder. Because it wasn't... Hello. Um... Oh, hey, Jonah. What's going on? Good to see you. Hear from you. We uh, might be crossing paths again uh, in sometime this summer. Uh, or you've got uh, computers and writing coming your way, so we'll certainly be in Lansing again. How have you been? So I, yeah, uh, especially this this time of time of year. <laughs> working on graphics to up your stream game to your level um, as I'm playing interactive fiction yeah uh, doing the most ungraphically intensive uh, thing right here alright so I've entered into the I've entered into the housing unit. Um, since no one ever moved into this unit, it's really nothing but an empty gray box. No bigger than your bedroom back home. Oh, thank, thanks for saying that. I'm trying to get better about, uh, about these things. Um, like most people, I can't stand the sound of my own voice, but uh, uh, I think especially for works of interactive fiction, it is um that eh, makes for a more interesting experience rather than especially for streaming purposes i, I think it would be even worse to just <laughs> have <laughs> excuse me have me just sitting here on a camera um anyway the first colonists were expected to take their meals in a central dining commons, and bathrooms were to be in a separate structure, with each one shared by a number of people. Yeah, you know, and I guess ideally, like one of the reasons I decided to do this was to see how viable it was as an ongoing thing. I mean, um, you know, I know there are text readers, and that that might actually be something worth trying too. But uh, um, it would be interesting to see this, you know, ha ha doing a work of interactive fiction and then allowing the audience to make the choices. Um, that would be the ultimate goal, I think. But uh, that was, I mean, I'm just kind of doing a test run here. It uh, seem, I mean, seems to be going pretty well. Since no one ever moved into this unit, it's really nothing but an empty gray box, no bigger than your bedroom back home. Oh no, don't worry about interrupting. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I appreciate the, the conversation. Yeah, text readers would be really interesting. Um, it's another project I've, I've been wanting to do for a while is have text read by a, a text reader while I'm actually playing something with the sound off or at least um, I don't know I think it would be interesting to see what you could pair a te you know pairing certain texts with uh, certain games I think that would be um, pretty interesting uh, but probably wouldn't do it on this channel uh, maybe my own but uh, yeah, I, plus text readers have such interesting voices, and I can only imagine what it would 
be like for a work of interactive fiction? I don't know. I, I think... Yeah, I mean, another project would be hacking a Google smart speaker. I know John Cayley has done some work with the uh, what do you, Amazon's whatever that is, same smart speaker. So um, it would be interesting. Yeah, well, uh, take the burden off you to read everything you type. Absolutely. Plus, it's um, especially if you were playing something. Part of the reason I haven't done this yet is because I I'm not sure how like you could get a book holder but then you would be uh, reading. Plus, not to mention, God, that would be exhausting, I think. Um, since no one ever moved into this unit, if you have any suggestions for uh, text readers, I am completely clueless, and I would be doing a Google search. So if you have any recommendations, that would be fantastic. Since no one ever moved into this unit, it's really nothing but an empty gray box, no bigger than your bedroom back home. These quarters weren't designed with anything but sleeping in mind. The first colonists were expected to take their meals in a central dining commons, and bathrooms were to be in a separate structure, with each, eat that, each one shared by a number of people. Still, you can't help but feel a twinge. This was going to be someone's home. The first thing they saw when they woke up, the place they looked forward to retreating to after a hard day of doing research or exploring the planet's surface or helping to maintain the colony. There were going to be pictures on these walls, footprints on the floor. Now the only footprints left here will be yours. Nah. <laughs> You know, I think I, I would be willing to bet. I know Apple Macs have them built in. Windows probably does as well, but I've never come across it. Um, but I would be willing to bet that there's some pretty good academic software out there. Natural Reader, maybe. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I typed in sleep. You may be feeling drowsy in real life, but not in the story. I think the key will be finding one that works with pixels on screen rather than particular apps. Yeah, this is, um, you know, the other, it is, inter I mean, this is a the application that I am, I don't know if you can't see it, the application that I'm playing this on is a little a uh, piece of software I've never heard of before, and it must be specific to playing uh, Inform 7 games. Um, so I'm not sure if there's, you know, if there's a manual or, you know, it's just uh, um, playing around with this a little bit. Oh, text reader. Examine the spacesuit. Your spacesuit comes custom made to fit someone your size is much less cumbersome and bulky than the spacesuits of the past. This one is actually quite stylish. It says W. McKay on the front. I'm going to save. It's awesome that this has the, compa the capability of saving. Um, my idea, my hope is to be able to finish this uh, within an hour. I'm only, I've been playing this half hour and I don't think that's going to happen. Um, let's see.
among the ruins of the power plant. The power plant is a, is in substantially worse shape than the living quarters, and considering that those were completely wrecked, that's saying something. Though the fissionable materials were especially packaged to prevent them from exploding, the Geiger counter in your suit indicates that this area is still very radioactive. I'll explain that part later. For now, let's just say it's very dangerous and you should probably be moving along. Okay, I'm, by the way, just always heading north. Um, and it looks like I've come full circle. You're standing near what appears to be most of a bulldozer, maybe the one that the tread you saw used to be attached to. Aside from that, this area is fairly desolate. Among the ruins of the greenhouse. The colonization plans for a central, called for a central dome where plants designed to live in the harsh, lifeless soil of the red planet would be grown and used for food. Everywhere you look are broken containers that once held seed pods and now contain nothing but cinders and ash. Among the shattered seed pod containers you see one single, undamaged one. The moment you touch the seed pod container, the clicking in your helmet stops. This is the only item you will be able to save sure I have a check my inventory you are carrying a seed pod container which is closed you are wearing your spacesuit the seed pod container is a red globe about the size of a cantaloupe which is designed to withstand an awful lot of damage but can be opened with a single twist Open container. You open the seed pod container, revealing a seed pod. The seed pod, designed for rapid growth even in a hostile environment, looks like the sort of cross between a pine cone and a small pineapple. Close container. You close the seed pod container. Inventory, make sure. Got it. <coughs> Keep going north. In the shallow crater, every remnant of the colony you've encountered so far has left a depression. Remnant means a remaining piece. Depression means a sort of bowl-shaped hole in the ground. It can also mean being really, really sad, but that's a different kind of depression. But this crater wasn't caused by any of the debris from the explosion. This crater is ancient and huge. The meteorite that caused it maybe was a kilo kilometer across kilometer sorry Oof. it's also shallow for its size meaning that some sort of erosion has been at work maybe this planet once held water and life but it doesn't anymore hey kiddo don't fall asleep on me yet enter crater that's not something you can enter this crater is ancient and huge in the earth the cause it was north again. As much as you might like to go exploring, now that you've found what you're looking for, you really should get back to the ship. Your spacesuit has a limited supply of power and oxygen. So I'll go south. I'm going to keep going south until I get to back to my ship. Okay, you're standing at the base of your ship. Enter ship. Gently placing the seed pod on the seat next to you, you rock it back into space, leaving the red planet in your wake. Soon a familiar cloud-streaked blue ball appears on your monitors. You are home again at last. But something goes terribly wrong. The heat shield holds up fine during re-entry, but the parachutes fail to open as you head for a splashdown. And so you plummet at an incredible rate, the ocean growing closer and closer. You hear a splash. Uh, the screen has gone from red back to white. And I am in the perspective of another uh, character. In your home office, when you and Sam put that down payment on this house five years ago, you were expecting that you were going to need all four bedrooms eventually. But after the complications with Allison, you found yourself with a couple of extras on your hands. <clears throat> This one came in very handy when you started telecommuting. 
You can't say you're exactly glad that this room became an office instead of a bedroom for a brother or sister of Allie's, but you are glad that you and Sam decided not to move into that smaller house you were considering. Your computer screen is, as usual, cluttered with the details of the Peterson account. It's been weeks, but you and your co-workers down at the office finally seem to have the Peterson account wrapped up. You wonder whether you might be able to nip down to the office for the party they're sure to have once the account is finally sent off. In the hall. You're standing in the hallway just outside your office. Your guest Gabriel's room lies just ahead of you, the door wide open. A flight of stairs leads down to the ground floor. And I enter room. In Gabriel's room. You've managed to get good use out of the fourth bedroom as well, taking in an exchange student through the Tertalia World Youth Program. In exchange for you providing Gabriel with room and board, Allison is entitled to spend a year attending school and living with Gabriel's family in Paraguay when she's 18, should she choose to go. Whether Allie will have any inclination to visit Paraguay in 14 years is an open question. You walk up to the window and take a look outside and feel a bayonet slice through your heart. Allie is floating face down in the pool. It takes all your willpower you possess to take the stairs merely five at a time instead of simply throwing yourself down the staircase. In the backyard. Your backyard isn't exactly sprawling, but it was more than big enough to accommodate the small swimming pool which Allison was never supposed to be allowed near. At least not until she learned to swim. Allie is fl floating face down in the pool. Gabriel pokes his head outside to see what's the matter. Ay he cries. Rescue her from the pool. I will call the emergency. You jump into the pool and in a matter of seconds have Allie safely on the cement bank, but she still isn't breathing. Gabriel comes dashing back outside, telephone in hand. The ambulances are coming, and at the same time I have the instructions for the CPR, he declares. First you must tilt her head back. Head back. Good, Gabriel says. Now you must breathe into her mouth. Good, Gabriel says. Now you must press her chest. Press chest. <clears throat> you apply pressure to Allie's chest, and suddenly she coughs up a mouthful of water. A minute later, she is sitting up and looking around bewilderedly. Allison, you cry. Allison, baby, how many times have we told you not to go near the pool? Another minute and we would have lost you. You know you're not supposed to go near. I wanted to see, she says. What, you say? I wanted to see, she says, if the world looked the same under the water as it does over it. Sea blue. Looks like Windows 10 built-in narrator function reads text, but not images of text like what's playing in the Twitch window. Yeah, it might be... Um, at least for this software. Um, I know, I'll have to see if there's a, a way to do this. Maybe, uh, let's see. Anyway. C blue. That would be great. I would really appreciate that. Um, there's been such a great development in accessibility, especially with regard to games. I can't remember any of the the names of the organizations and people and projects that are that are tackling this, but um, it's great that this work is being done. And, you know, especially for interactive fiction, um, you wouldn't think it would be so, there would be these obstacles, but, um, you know, especially this work, 20 years old, um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure these things have been thought about before. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, cobbling the, uh, the software together, I guess, to, to make it happen. But that would be great. I really appreciate that. Uh, 
interesting to see, um, especially for, you know, because I teach online every once in a while, and uh, that's something that uh, I really want to uh, do the, you know, make sure that work is done. <clears throat> so now it looks like we're back in um, the astronaut's body, although the type is now blue, as is uh, much of the interface window. Your spaceship was able to survive the impact with the ocean easily. You barely even felt the jolt. Impact is what it's called when things smack into each other. There wasn't even any damage unless you count the flotation devices bursting. But you should definitely count that, because without your floats, your ship sinks like a stone down, down, down into the murky depths. <clears throat> You're still not worried, since you can always just fly the ship right back up to the surface, except that when you hit bottom, the enemies go dead. You try to restart them with no success. Um, you know, if you were asking about accessibility, I would be interested in seeing if there's also a way to navigate through this without using a keyboard or how that's done. Um, if there are voice commands or what, how, and this isn't, uh, not sure I would tackle it for, for something like this, but just out of curiosity, I'd be interested in what, how interfaces are, you know, like this keyboard. <clears throat> is used if I, by those who don't have um, use of their, their hands. Hmm. Yeah, that uh, speech to text has been around for a little while. Um, I've never, I've never used it. Uh, I always thought that would be handy to have for uh, for note taking, but um, never never tried it. So you're still not worried since you can always just fly the ship right back up to the surface, except that when you hit bottom, the engines go dead. You try to restart them with no success. Fortunately, your spacesuit is watertight and more than capable of protecting you from the water pressure that would otherwise crush you like a soda can. It will have to. You're going to have to swim for it. You gather up your seed pod, head to the airlock, turn on the lights in your suit, and hope for the best. Airlock. Well, this is a first. You're standing on the door of the airlock. Usually you're firm, firmly rooted to the floor, and the door is just as firmly set in the wall, or else you're floating weightlessly, and there's no real up or down. But the ship landed at an odd angle, and you're not quite sure what to expect when you open the doors. If there isn't enough room for you to crawl out between the door and the ocean bottom, you're in some serious trouble. The wall, or now floor, is festooned with a big blue button, which opens the door. Festooned means adorned. Hmm? Oh, adorned means decorated. I'm playing Hellblade uh, at the moment, and there's... This is reminding me of the uh, simulation of psychosis that the developers of Hellblade um, were striving for. This is a, and I didn't, this wasn't in any of the other storylines, so I'm wondering if these parentheses are indicating. Push button. You've had a couple of experiences with explosive decompression where you open up the airlock door and the rush of escaping air blows you out into space. This time the rush of water flooding into the airlock smashes you up into the ceiling. Or at least now it's the ceiling. It used to be the back wall. Luckily your suit is able to cushion the blow. Soon the airlock is full of water and you are able to swim out the door which closes behind you. In the great hall. At first you're confused. You'd expect the ocean bottom to be centimeters from the open door. Instead you drift down, down, ever down, 
and when your feet do finally touch something solid, it isn't the silt of the bottom of the sea, but a stone floor. You look up, hoping to see a glimmer of the surface. Instead, you find a stone ceiling, far too high above your head to reach, and right where you might expect to find a chandelier. You see the blinking blue lights around the outside of your ship's airlock through the hole it made upon impact. You have crashed into an undersea castle. Moldy stone walls stand all around you, dimly visible through the murk. You feel them more than see them. Chunks of fallen stone from the ceiling lie scattered about at your feet. You can barely make out arched doorways leading north and south. Also at your feet is the seed pod. You lost track of it in the rush of the water. You scoop it up. Make sure you're carrying a seed pod container. Arch doorways leading north and south. North has served me well so far. In the keep. You are standing in the keep, a fortified tower inside the castle walls. Fortified means strengthened. A stone spiral staircase leads upward, but stops abruptly when it reaches the ceiling. You take a few steps up the staircase, but decide not to hit your head on the ceiling. Okay. again. Try west, east. Salmon staircase. The stairs are slippery with mold but are otherwise solid. You decide not to hit your head on the ceiling. Examine ceiling. The stairs lead right up to the top. The clearance between the top step and the ceiling is a couple of centimeters at best. Okay, I've gone south a couple times. This is a great empty chamber, just like the one you landed in, except for a long stone slab that you decide must be a dining table. You don't have any evidence for this. You don't know how this castle got here or who may, might have lived in it. For all you know, they might have been incredibly tall, skinny, water-breathing creatures, and this one was one of their beds. But for the time being, we'll call it a dining table. Exits once again lead north and south. Going south again. In the throne room. This room is just as big as the others you've seen, but unlike the others, this one contains a barnacle encrusted object in the unmistakable shape of a chair. Given the place you found it and the fact that it's built into the floor, you can only conclude that it must be a throne. The far wall features a carved out alcove that looks like it must have been a fireplace. Though how one might go about lighting a fire underwater is anyone's guess. Mounted on the wall above the fireplace in an X shape are a pickaxe and a shovel. Take pickaxe. The pickaxe clings, clings firmly to the wall. You tug on it again and this time the handle moves a few centimeters. Then you feel a distinct click. The castle begins to rumble, with the shaking most pronounced in the direction of the keep. The shovel, which was wedged behind a pickaxe, clatters to the ground, and the rumbling stops. After that, the pickaxe swings back into place. Right, go north again. This is a great empty chamber, just like the one you landed in. Go back to the great hall. Moldy stone walls stand before you. Let's see if I can... Ah, aha, see? You are standing in the keep, a fortified tower inside the castle walls. A stone spiral staircase leads upward to the ocean's surface. So that pickaxe was the trigger. Now I'm going up. You start up the stairs, the murk gradually diminishing as you come closer and closer to the surface. But just as the sun starts to resolve from a general glow into the specific bright blob above you, a vicious rip current pulls you off the staircase and drags you further out to sea. The sheer power of the current throws you for a loop. 
You thrash in vain against it, crying out in frustration as your muscles begin to cramp from the effort, while you continue to be dragged further and further out to sea. Finally, you try swimming parallel to shore, uh, and that what that frees you from the current's grip. For several long moments, you drift aimlessly in the ocean, exhausted. When you do at last get your wind back and take your bearings, you find yourself kilometers from the nearest hint of land. Sighing, you start for shore. Your suit feels unexpectedly cumbersome, but you dare not take it off. Even if it does make you tire that much faster, at least you don't risk drowning. Or rather, you don't risk drowning until your oxygen supply runs out. Luckily, this doesn't happen until your feet at long last touch the shore. You drag yourself onto the beach, blinding spots dancing before your eyes. Your knees give out even as you tear off your helmet and everything goes dark. Everything is, so the screen has now shifted back to white. Everything is dark. No matter how much you strain your eyes, you can't see the faintest hint of light, but whispering voices tickle the edge of your hearing. Please enter a command. Listen, it says, distance call to Asuncion. Frat boys completely uninjured. Husband has an excellent. I'm, I'm continuing to type in listen. At least she didn't suffer. Vending machine ate my dollar. No longer in darkness, light flickers before your eyes. At first you don't see anything familiar, and then suddenly Linda is there by your side. You are in a hospital bed. What? What? You start to ask. Shh, Linda says. You need to save your strength. The doctors say you'll be fine, but it'll take some time. Is she? How? The effort to speak became become too much, and you have to rest for a moment. How? For a moment, Linda seems confused. Then she realizes what you're asking. She shakes her head sadly, and suddenly the room seems colder. Gold. So now it is a gold-colored screen. The sand is curiously cold against your face as you wake up, the waves licking at the soles of your boots. Cold and hard, more like gravel or even cobblestone than sand. As you lift your head and look around, you notice something else wrong. The sand is the wrong color. It's darker, more metallic. It's gold. On the Golden Beach. You are at the south end of the beach, a glittering crescent nestled between the crashing ocean to the east and towering cliffs to the west, ankle deep in gold. You run your hands through it. Rings, coins, nuggets, and gold dust. Drifting down from the sky, collecting in dunes, the dust is everywhere. You run your hands through your hair and your gloves come out looking like they belong to a statuette. To your relief, your seed pod is washed up onto the beach in excellent condition, though the container it was in is nowhere to be found. Take pod. Your head swims for a moment. You still haven't fully recovered from your struggle against the ocean. Check inventory. You are carrying nothing. You are wearing your space suit. Examine pod. The seed pod designed for, oh, for rapid growth, even in a hostile environment, looks sort of like a cross between a pine cone and a small pineapple. Its dip in the ocean seems to have caused wispy green sprouts to emerge from deep inside it. Plant the pod. There doesn't seem to be any soil on the ground in which to plant the seed pod. Listen, you hear the roar of the ocean. You're at the south end of the beach, a glittering crescent nestled between the crashing ocean to the east and towering cliffs to the west, ankle deep in gold. I'll go west. The cliffs are too far steep to climb, right? Go north. On the golden beach, 
You are right in the middle of the golden beach, which stretches off to the north and south. Something wooden is buried in the sand at your feet, but it's buried so deeply that only a corner of it is visible. Dig. Forget something? Like that shovel over the fireplace in the castle? Okay, we'll just pretend that you had it all along. There, you've got the shovel. Now try digging. So I didn't take the shovel. You dig for a few minutes and seem to be making good progress and suddenly the handle of the shovel, shovel snaps off. Apparently all that time underwater weakened it after all. Luckily you no longer need it. You've done enough digging that you're able to grab the wooden object and pull it loose. It's a treasure chest, a tiny one. What's more, it doesn't seem to be locked. I like how this is not necessarily giving me the answers, but it's, it is, however, letting the story proceed without, um, you know, too much regret, I guess. Open chest. Opening the container reveals dirt. Someone must have found this very precious, which makes sense. It was buried in a place where gold was everywhere and so wasn't especially valuable. Dirt, on the other hand, seems to be quite rare around here since it's so scarce. It's worth keeping safe. If you took the dirt out now, you wouldn't be able to get it all back in. That's not a risk worth taking, at least not now. the north end of the golden beach which stretches off to the south though the cliffs to the north butt right up against the ocean there is a pass to the northwest with something shiny visible through the gap in the cliffs a platinum seashell rests along the water's edge examine seashell there is an enormous conch shell made entirely of platinum platinum is a metal even more expensive than gold it's almost white People with really, really light blonde hair are called platinum blonde. And then if a record sells a million copies, they call it going platinum. Take shell. As you reach out to take the shell, a crab emerges from inside it and skitters off into the sea, dragging the shell along with it. Look, crab. Uh, let's see, northwest. You take one last look at the Golden Beach and stride off through the pass. And I'm back, shifted back into the white screen. You take one last look at the hockey game on TV and stride through the garage door to tell Allie it's time to come in. Garage. This was supposed to be a two-car garage, but with the trash cans, your workbench, Allie's bike, and the rest of the junk that's taken up residence in this place, you're lucky to be able to even squeeze just the Volvo in here. In the front yard. One of the advantages of living on the outskirts of town is that you were able to get a house with a little bit of land around it, which isn't to say that you have to walk a kilometer to get to your neighbor's house just that you can actually take a few steps outside your door and not be on anyone else's property. Allie is sprawled on the front lawn, gazing up at the stars. Hi, Daddy, she says. How come the night sky is dark? I mean, with all the stars in the universe, if you look in any direction, wouldn't you act eventually see a star? Talk to Allie. Please select one. Tell Allie about inverse square law. Two, tell Allie about crystalline spheres. Three, Allie come inside. Or zero, select zero to say nothing. Zero, you decide not to say anything after all.
I will tell Allie about Crystalline's fears. Well, you say people used to think it was because there were only a few stars and they were just tiny points of light set in the outermost of a set of crystalline spheres that surrounded the Earth. Crystalline just means like a crystal. Oh, may have been right, Jonah. There is the there are the parentheticals again. Uh, there were a whole bunch of these spheres nestled nested inside of one another. I think the Moon was closest, then Mercury, then Venus then the sun, then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, then the stars, and outside that was heaven. So how does it really work, Ali asks. Tell Ali about the inverse square law. Mary thinks it's a little strange that you started choosing introductory astrophysics texts, texts as your bedtime reading material, but it really pays off at moments like this. Well, you say, lying down on the grass next to Allie, it has to do with the inverse square law. Think of a star and imagine putting up an enormous sheet of paper about one astronomical unit away. The star will light up a certain area of the piece of paper. Now take that paper and put it two astronomical units away. That area that the star lights up will be twice as tall and twice as wide, but it's the same amount of light hitting it, the same number of photons only spread out over an area four times as big. That means if you look at a small area of the sheet of paper, only one-fourth as many photons are hitting it, so it looks one-fourth as bright. If you look at it from ten times as far away, it looks one-hundredth one as bright. That means the further that, the way that you get, the fewer photons have a chance of reaching your eyes. Now you may think that you'd have the number of stars in your visual field increasing just as fast as their intensity decreases, but the universe is finite. You could write the number of stars in the universe on a single piece of notebook player, paper, and the observable universe is even more finite, the universe expanding fast enough that the photons from a lot of stars haven't had a chance to reach us yet and maybe never will. So eventually you run out, and if you factor in all the things that can block the photons that do have a chance to get here, clouds or of hydrogen gas for instance, only the photons from the closest and brightest stars make it to your eyes. The rest of the sky looks dark. Cool, Allie says. Is that true about everything a star sends out or just light? Tell Allie about solar radiation. Well, you say a star doesn't emit a whole lot except, li except light. If by light you mean photons, which can range any... Isn't Allie supposed to be like a child? which can range anywhere from radio waves to x-rays and beyond. And then there's the solar wind, which is mostly protons. And then there are neutrinos, which go through pretty much everything. People have collected huge pools of gallium, which put them deep underground. And it turns out that 30 tons of the stuff, 30 tons, will catch one neutrino a day. The neutrino will turn one atom of gallium into germanium. All the other billions and billions of neutrinos just go streaming right through the earth, but you can't see them because they go right through your eyes. Awesome, Allie says. Where does gallium come from? Tell Allie about gallium production. Good question. The easy answer is that it's mined, but there's one more interesting answer. You know what a star is, right? Sure, Allie says. It's a big ball of hydrogen being fused with helium. Bing, you say, right as usual. Now eventually the hydrogen runs out. What happens to the helium left over? Some of it gets expelled out into space and the rest of it contracts even tighter until the helium starts to fuse. So the star lights up again, turning helium into carbon and then into oxygen. And the process keeps going. Some of the matter is expelled into space. The rest keeps contracting, fusing into neon, magnesium, silicon, and eventually into iron. Iron is pretty much the most stable thing there is. Right now, hydrogen is the most common substance there is, but if you wait long enough, it'll be iron. Now, iron is element number 26, and gallium is number 31, so you'll never get to gallium that way. Heavy elements like gallium or gold are produced in supernova. They are formed when stars explode and fly out into space. Really? Gold, Ellie says? It just comes raining down out of space? Tell Allie about planetary accretion. If I say nothing.
Maybe indirectly, you say. See the newly formed heavy elements fly out into space and collect in gravity wells, start clumping together. Some end up inside new second or third generation stars, while others get locked up in planets, only to get dug up a few billion years later and used for neutrino detection or jewelry or coins. Of course, gold is used in coins because it's valuable, and it's valuable because it's rare, and it's rare because... Well, to a certain extent, it's the luck of the draw. If you look at a chart of the elements in the Earth's crust, it turns out that iridium and the elements around it are even rarer than you might expect. Right after iridium is platinum, which is very precious. And after that is gold, which is just slightly more common and just slightly less precious. But if you look at meteorites, you find that they're not lacking in iridium the way the Earth is. Meteorites are loaded with the stuff, and they've got even more platinum. So it's easy to imagine that there are planets out there where there just so happened to be a lot of gold and platinum in the area of space where the planet was formed. And so they're considered common in something else. Zirconium, maybe, and it's considered really valuable. I've heard of iridium before, Ali says. There isn't a lot of it in the layer of Earth's crust that comes from right when all the dinosaurs died out. I remember reading something like that. That's right, you say. That's usually counted as evidence that it was a meteorite impact that led them all to dying off. Not that the iridium killed them, but that iridium is a sign that there was a big meteorite around that time. And it's easy to see how a big impact could lead to massive die-offs. But that's also an important thing to keep in mind when you think about this stuff. One bit of pure gold is exactly the same as any other bit of pure gold. The substance behaves the same way. So from one point of view, any particular piece of gold isn't valuable at all, since you can always get another. You can even replace your iridium. But Michael Crichton notwithstanding, you can't get back any of the dinosaurs. You're not made, you're not made of a whole lot that's particularly exotic. The only stuff heavier than iron, the only things you'd need a supernova for, are trace elements. A little iodine to keep the goiter away, that kind of thing. You're main, made mainly of other common star stuff, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. But you can't just trade yourself in for a sack of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen the way you can trade gold for gold. What makes you you is the way that star stuff is arranged, and that's totally unique which makes you more valuable than all the gold from all the stars in the sky. And what am I, chopped liver, Mary asks, emerging from the garage? All the stars in the sky? Really, Sam, when you start trying to wax poetic, it's a pretty good sign that it's past your bedtime, let alone Allie's. Time to come in, kids. Okay, Mom, Allie says. She stands up and stretches. Night, Daddy. Good night, honey, you say. Sweet dreams. As you follow her inside, you pause to take a quick look at the sky yourself. It's certainly pretty, but it's been a long time since you were as enraptured by it as Allie seems to be. You can't help but feel a little sad about that. Sky blue. Again, changing color. As you walk through the pass, you encounter first one shard of glass on the ground, then another. But it isn't until you crest the final hill that you see what you've discovered. taking a bit of a break to check things out. <sighs> Not to mention take a break from reading. Oh my goodness.
As you walk through the pass, you encounter first one shard of glass on the ground, then another. But it isn't until you crest the final hill that you see what you've discovered before the crystal labyrinth. You are standing on a ridge above the entrance to a vast crystal labyrinth. You'd be tempted to call it a city with its haphazard collection of iridescent towers and spirals and arches. Iridescent means shimmering with rainbow colors, but from what you can see from your vantage point, there is barely enough space between the crystal walls to permit one person to pass between them. The labyrinth is ringed by steep mountains, so going around it is impossible. Your only choices are to enter it to the west or to head back the way you came. Well, of course I'm going to enter it. You step into the crystal labyrinth and immediately get lost. In the crystal labyrinth, you are dazzling. You are in a dazzling crystal maze with passages leading out to the north, south, and west. Oh boy. So, west... This is where graph paper becomes it comes in handy. So I'm gonna go west. You're in a dazzling crystal maze with passages leading out to the north west and east north you are in a dazzling crystal maze with passages leading out to the west east and north but not south oh there it is east west and south Two of the nearby walls intersect to form the base of an immense spire. So let's, let's, I'm going to try going east. Passages leading out to the north, south, and west. I believe if I go south, I'll be at the entrance. Passages leading out to the east, west, west, east, and south. Then we go west, north. You're in a dazzling crystal maze with an audible sputter. The cooling unit of your spacesuit finally gives out. You're in a dazzling crystal maze with passages leading out into the west east and south and I go west again with well, its cooling unit broken your bulky spacesuit begins to feel very uncomfortable it's like wearing a parka on a warm sunny day remove suit you take off your spacesuit and drop it to on the ground solid crystal walls block your path north west Cool breeze ruffles the feathers of your wings. North, south, and west. Go west. North, west, and east. West. You can see your spacesuit here. Hmm. Oh, I already screwed up my map. North. Hmm. Something's not quite right here. Oh, thanks, Jonah. Talk to you later. All right, 
You wander through a maze of glass until you find yourself in another intersection. You are in a dazzling crystal maze with passages in the south. You see your space. If you ask, I'm definitely doing a circle. Listen, you hear nothing unexpected. <laughs> of course.
Hmm. Up. You stretch your wings and soar into the sky, flying above the crystal labyrinth. You are hovering above the crystal labyrinth. From this perspective, it looks like a mind-bogglingly complex mandala. A mandala is a pattern that some people use in prayer. There is no way you could have possibly navigated it on the ground. In fact, it almost gives you a headache. Much more relaxing is the cloudless, sparkling blue sky all around you. A bird flies by. A bird flies by, disappearing through the gap in the mountains to the west. West. You fly through the pass, reveling in the rush of wind against your white feathered wings. She's an angel. She's an absolute angel. No. No, can't think like that. She's just a kid like any other kid. Completely approachable. Puts her pants on one leg at a time like anyone else. Oops, bad move. Should not have thought about her putting on pants. Concentrate, concentrate, focus, power. Eye of the tiger, wax on, wax off. Wait, that's not right. Come on, don't overthink this. Just go in and ask her, hey, Allie, what's up? Want to go to the dance with me? Easy as that. What's the worst that could happen? Well, you could wet your pants. Funny how it always comes back to pants. You walk into the gym. Queen Sport Middle School Gym. Usually rather damp and dingy, the gym is cur currently festooned with colorful balloons and streamers in preparation for the big dance Friday night. The first ones went up at lunch, so when you went in for your fifth period PE class, the coach looked around, shrieked, and declared that there was a change in plans and that the class would be playing soccer for the rest of the week. You look around and there, far above your head, is Allie, glowing like a star. Or maybe that's just from standing in front of the spotlight rigged to the ceiling. She's balanced on a tall ladder, draping streamers from the rafters. Her colleagues on the student activities committee, Joyce and Cheryl, are standing around a helium tank, filling balloons and letting them float up to the ceiling. Allie looks down as you come in. Hey, John, she says. Can you turn off that light for me? It's burning kind of hot. She turns off. She points at the switch. Turn off light. Off. You turn the light off. Thanks, Allie says. She, that about does it for the streamers. She climbs back down the ladder, digs around in her backpack, and pulls out an orange. Want one, she asks. Ask Allie for an orange. Tell Allie about a lack of animosity. To ask Allie about possible paramours. Ask Allie to the dance on Friday. Allie digs around her backpack. Oops, looks like that was the last one. I've got an apple left, though. She tosses it to you. So, um, are you, like, seeing anyone or not? Or uh, your voice dies away. Not so as you'd notice, Allie says cheerfully. You take a deep breath. It doesn't take, so you try it again. Well, um, so... I was just kind of wondering whether maybe you weren't doing anything and were already going, whether you might want to go to the dance with me if you want. I mean, it's no big deal or anything. It's up to you. I just thought you know why not. There you think. That was pretty smooth. But Allie shakes her head. Sorry, she says. I'm babysitting that evening. Your heart plummets into your stomach with what you're sure is an audible splash. You're trying to decide whether to throw yourself in front of the nearest bus or if you should just go home and slash your wrist when you realize Allie isn't finished talking. So it'll have to be Saturday, she concludes. Satur Wait, so that's a yes? You ask gaping. Sure, she says. It won't be a dance, but I'm sure we can find something fun to do. Can you come around 7? Saturday, 7 o'clock, 75 hours, 43 minutes, 17 seconds from now. Suddenly it seems like a lifetime. Driving down Bartlett Hill Road. As you pass Allie's school, you can't help but notice that the message board outside says, Dance, Friday, gym, 6 to 10 p.m. There was a dance tonight, you ask? You should have told us. We could have found another sitter. That's okay, Allie says drowsily. You and Ms. McKay asked before any boys did. 
Still, you say, next time you should just call us and give us... Uh, give us the old heave-ho, okay? I'm sure there must be a legion of boys out there who cried themselves to sleep, thanks to us. Allie smiles sleepily. You sound like my dad, she says. Ask Allie about how I sound like her dad. Hmm? Allie says, oh, it's just that when you were talking about legions of boys crying themselves to sleep, it reminded me of how my dad's always telling me that you're at the age now where you're going to have to deal with droves of grubby little boys vying for your affections. And I just wanted to warn you that I'm bound to show an inordinate amount of glee at every heart you break. So go to it, she smiles. You cruise through Polk Boulevard intersection. You know, Wendy's crazy about you, you say. We take her to buy clothes and she wants to dress like you. We take her to get her hair cut and she wants it done like yours. And every time you come over, she spends the next couple of days throwing around words like conquistador and geosynchronous. And she gets an 800 on her verbal SAT, we'll know who to thank. Well, when I was her age, I hated it when people talked down to me, Ali shrugs, so I'd be hypocritical of me to talk down to her. Well, when I asked him about that, he said, You see, it's just like Freud said, the parent of, a pow of the powerless sex always longs to have a child of the powerful sex. And sure enough, after years of having to deal with being on the receiving end of possible rejection every time I was interested in someone, it's going to be a thrill to see my own kid dishing it out. It's a clear-cut case of Venus envy. You go over the train tracks and through the O'Brien Boulevard intersection. I hate to ask you over, to come over twice in less than a week, you say, but are you free to look after Wendy on Thursday? If not, please just say the word and we can find someone else. I don't want to keep you from hanging out with kids your own age. Sure, no problem, Ali says. I don't really mind. I like spending time with Wendy. Most of my friends are either significantly younger or significantly older than me anyhow. You cruise through the Nelson Boulevard intersection. Wow, all of the lights seem to be green this evening. You're driving Allie Dawson home in your plushy, appoint, plushly appointed luxury sedan. A bit pricey, but after your last raise, you figured you could afford to splurge a little. You enter the Montgomery Boulevard intersection. You are blindsided by a car screaming down the road with its lights off at 100 kilometers an hour. Maybe more. The impact caves in the passenger side door and sends the car spinning wildly. The air thick with smoke and the acrid smell of burnt rubber. Allie's blood hot against your face, and as you black out, you catch a glimpse of the light. And it was green. It was green. It was green. Green. On the other side of the pass, you'll find, you find yourself flying over a vast forest that stretches as far as you can see. The mere sight of it is enough to make your wings ache, but there's no w way you can fly that far under your own power. Besides, the idea of strolling through a shady forest seems awfully appealing right about now. You touch down and wander through the woods. In the forest. After a few minutes, you reach a small clearing and pause to take a look around. Something is wrong. In fact, everything is just slightly off. The leaves of the trees don't sway enough in the breeze. The subtle sounds of the forest are conspicuously absent. Everything sterile smells sterile and dead, but you can't quite put your finger on why this is. Look at trees. As you look more closely at the trees, you suddenly realize what's wrong with them. They're not alive. The trunks and branches of the trees are solid stone, petrified wood, the organic material placed with silica from the groundwater over the course of millions of years. Silica is silicon dioxide, which makes up sand, quartz, and all kinds of things. But these are not mere stone pillars. They're all still trees, complete with leaves made of malachite a green marbled stone derived from copper and is arresting in its own way as emerald. Arresting means it makes you stop and look. 
You don't have much time to ponder this mystery, however. Suddenly you hear a growling in the distance and turn to see a wolf charging right at you. Talk to wolf. Unfortunately, you and the wolf don't speak the same language. The wolf bounds closer and it looks like it's about to leap for your throat. The wolf jumps at you, knocking you to the ground and starts playfully licking your face. The danger passed, you get up and gather up your possessions, the wolf trotting merrily along at your heels. You plant the seed pod, step back and wait for it to grow. Nothing happens. You hear a soft chuckling behind you. Well, well, says a voice, if it isn't a pirate turned astronaut, Wendy McKay. What are you doing in the Queen's realms? You turn around to find a diminutive man with a bushy white beard pushing along a white cart almost as big as he is. Diminutive is another word for small. Who are you, you ask? I am the local weather salesman, and I'm, I'd say that you're not going to have much success growing things without some rain handy. He rummages through his cart. You're in luck. I just happen to have some in stock. Ask salesman about Queen. Excellent. Can't be from around here. That's from sh for sure, the weather salesman says. Nothing stays living for long any place that falls into the Queen's domain. Trees turn into stone. Birds fly away. Even the dirt turns to metal. Poor thing probably wandered in, got lost, and half starved to death with nothing to eat. No one's ever seen the queen, the weather salesman says. No one I know of anyhow. Makes sense. Nothing lives for long in any land that falls into her realm. Looking at her probably turns people to stone. Hmm, the salesman says. Normally I ask for a gold piece, but it looks as though you have enough of the stuff in your hair for me to change my price. He reaches a Newark's cart and pulls out a comb. What say ye? You run your fingers through the hair and they come out golden. Apparently it collected quite a bit of gold dust while you were wandering around on the beach. Fair enough, you say. You sit down on the ground and the weather salesman goes to work with his comb. A few moments later, he gleefully puts two handfuls of gold dust in his cart. When you stand up and he snaps his fingers, a tiny cloud appears at knee level, raining a trickle of water into the planted pod. You start to complain, but suddenly there's no one to complain to. The salesman is gone without a trace. And in the end, it doesn't matter. Even this tiny rainstorm does its job. Shortly after the cloud dissipates, the plot pod shudders and a gr full-grown shrubbery erupts from inside, loaded with deep red berries and bright green leaves. The wolf starts nibbling at the berries, first tentatively and then with relish. And with the berries springing forth from the bush as fast as the wolf can eat them, it seems pretty clear that the wolf isn't going to starve to death after all. So while it looks as though you won't have anything from the Red Planet to hand over to headquarters once you get home, you have saved a life. And that's our story, end of our story for tonight, Ali says. What? But that can't be the end. There's still so much you don't know. Like, how do you get home? 
Are you even on the right planet? Do you get in trouble for not having the pot anymore? Who's this queen the weather salesman talked about? But wait, you begin. What about... Come on, Wendy, Allie says. You know the rules. It's way past your bedtime. Your parents will be home soon. If you're still up, it won't look good for either of us. I'll be right here if you need anything. She pulls a book out of her backpack and starts in on her homework. Ask Allie about the queen. The queen puts down her pencil. I guess I did slip that in there, didn't I? Well, all the settings from that story came from these weird dreams I've been having lately. But there's one more, one I haven't told you about. Are you sure you want to hear about this? Yeah, you say. Okay, Allie. She says it starts like this. Purple. In a dark place. I open my eyes, and I am in a cold, dim, lonely place. I blink, thinking my eyes are still closed. But then I realize that it's not pitch black. There is a dark purple fog billowing all around me, so close to black as to make nearly no difference. There is a faint purple glow to the stone floor, too, though I might not even notice if it weren't holding me up. Exit. I try to find my way out of this place, but no matter which direction I try or however far I go, it's all the same. Eventually, and maybe it's minutes, maybe it's days, I can suddenly make out a vague shape in the fog. Look at shape. It's strange because parts of it look distinctly human, but others are just as clearly not. I come closer and I discover the answer. It's a person sitting in a huge throne made of rock. No, that's not right. It's not made of rock. It is a rock. One single stone in the rough shape of a high-backed chair. Look at person. Her face is turned away from me, but I can tell it's a young woman dressed in long flowing purple garments. Dressed in royal purple, sitting in a throne, I can only assume that she's a queen or a princess of some sort. But since I don't believe in monarchy, and I'm certainly not one of her subjects, I don't feel the need to bow or scrape or call her your majesty. Hello, I say. Wait a moment. She turns to face After a moment, she turns to face me, and that's when I start to get really scared. She has my face. She's a lot older. She's got to be at least 20, but there can be no mistake. I'm talking to myself. Normally, this would be a sign of impending mental collapse, but luckily it's already a dream. Well, she says, are you going to flee in terror? Can't you feel the life seeping out of you already just by being near me? Can't you? Why should you be scared, she asked. No, I suppose you wouldn't know. Not yet. You're new here. But I suppose I might as well confess. See, I'm one of those girls with a rep. Everything I look at is supposed to die. And it's true. I am the queen of all I survey. And all I survey is long dead. But here's the part that no one believes. It was like that when I got here. I start to ask her another question, but then she starts talking again. When I arrived here, I was given proprietorship over all the realms I had dreamt of as a child, she says. But those were all places from which life had long since fled. Barren planets and crumbling castles, forests of stone and vacant crystal cities. Worlds upon worlds that were mine, all mine, and not a bit of it populated by any living creature. Sure, the occasional fish or fowl might wander through, but any creature that enters my domain either dies or leaves me. Nothing ever stays. I decide to say nothing after. I'm not quite sure what's going on with the interface here, but um, it seems to be proceeding. I'm just hitting enter. Uh, that time I hit an arrow. I decide to say nothing after all. The last thing she needs after what she just said is me asking the way to the nearest exit. No, the queen says, by all means, go. Go. You'll be back soon enough. She pauses. You see, I always remember this conversation from the other direction. We're home, you announced. Wendy, what are you still doing up? Sorry, Ms. McKay, says Allie the sitter. It's my fault. Our bedtime story sort of segued in a conversation about these dreams I've been having. I shouldn't have kept her up this late. Well, at least it's not a school night, you say. No harm done, I guess. Jim's waiting in the car, so you probably ought to get out there. As for you, Miss Wendy, you need to get to sleep pronto. Kiss, Wendy cries. Very well, you begin. But Wendy shakes her head. I mean, Allie, she says. Hmm, you say. As Allie flashes you an embarrassed smile and kisses Wendy on the cheek. 
Good night, kiddo, she says. Hope your dreams are sweeter than mine. Sure, no problem, Allie says. I enjoy it. Allie flush finishes stuffing her books in her backpack and puts it on. Okay, see you soon, she says. You follow her out to the garage door. Jim's car is dry waiting in the driveway, and as she walks toward it, she is swallowed up in the glare of the headlights. Pure white light blazes down on Allie's crib as Sam plugs in the huge screen he ordered through the mail and mounted it on the ceiling. Allie rubs her eyes. What is that thing anyway, you ask? Just a fluorescent light? Not at all, Sam says. The Photopia is a low-energy, high-intensity LCD screen with a bunch of different settings. He tosses you the remote. Just push the white button to cycle through them. Push button. You push the white button and the Photopia suddenly goes dark. But not, you realize after a moment, completely dark. Instead, it displays a field of stars, as if it were a skylight. Allie blinks and regards it curiously. There's more, Sam says. Hit the button again, and there's another mode that's even better. The screen changes once again. This time, it shows a black field over which three large circles, one red, one blue, one green, slowly drift. They bounce off the sides of the screen, but when they collide, they blend to form other colors, magenta, cyan, yellow, white. Allie claps with delight. I think we have a winner, Sam grins. Money well spent, says I. Okay, I know one kid who's up way past her bedtime. Can you get the lights on? You glance into the crib as you reach the light switch. Good night, Allie, you say. Sleep well. And that's it. All right, well, that was Photopia by Adam Cadre. Uh, that was pretty remarkable. Um, but it's been about an hour and 45 minutes. My voice is tired, and it's dark out, and I have a long bike. Well, not too long. I have a bike ride home. So I am going to head out. Um, this was Photopia, again, by Adam Cadre, um, a work of interactive fiction about... 20 years old. Uh, I believe it was created in Inform 7. It is freeware and it is available online. Uh, you can play it with a uh, small download, a uh, little bit of software that I'm using to play this. Um, I want to thank uh, folks who have popped in and out. Thank Big thanks to Jonah for uh, out at Michigan State for uh, stopping in and talking to me about um, speech or text to speech software, how we can uh, maybe do this without us, anyone having to read all of this. Um, but I thought it, that went really well. Um, going forward, we'll see what, um, I'm not sure if Nathan and or Josh will be here next week, uh, back with normal. Uh, cat's mustache episode um but uh in the meantime i'm going to look forward to uh doing some more works of interactive fiction um i believe if i can if i can't remember the um do some works by emily short and um yeah, we'll see what happens going forward so uh thanks again for joining um if you're just joining someone just jumped in a few minutes ago and i apologize for having to get going but i have to get home and i am tired of hearing my voice so have a good night have a good weekend um we'll see if you're interested in seeing more interactive fiction being read uh this is my Twitter handle um, and if you sit, drop me a message if you have any suggestions for other works of interactive fiction that might work well uh, streaming or um, examples as uh, we develop some inform produced inform 7 produced interactive fictions of our own here 
uh, please feel free to give me a shout. Um, all right, that's enough. I, I promised I would stop talking. So anyway, have a good weekend.